Example 4.3, two isolated concentric conducting spherical shells of neglectable thickness have radii in charge as shown. I want to plot the electric field and the potential field before you start your calculations. Then B, calculate the potentials at radial distances 4, 1, 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.2 meters and at R equals to zero. So the first thing that we want to do is plot both the electric field and the potential fields before calculating. So let's look at the electric field first. So the electric field is for two concentric conducting spherical shells. Now you got to remember that we have to pay attention to the discontinuities. So let's use Gauss's law, not to derive it, but to set up a picture here. So I have my inner shell, And then I have my outer shell. And what I know here is that I'm starting right here. And so when I'm looking at this, they say that the inner shell has a charge of Q1. So if this is Q1, then this has to have a charge of Q2. Both of these charges are positive. So when I'm looking at the radius, there's one radius here, which is R1, and then there's this radius here, which is R2. So now I'm going to look at my Gaussian. So if I look at my Gaussian, let's say that I pick my Gaussian in here, we could see immediately that there's no enclosed charge. So therefore, the electric field has to be zero. So if I start to write this down, I'm going to say that this is zero for r, little r, less than r1. And this is because q enclose is zero. Now I'm going to draw a larger Gaussian. And right away, you could see that I've enclosed now Q1. So according to Gauss's law, this has to be 4 pi epsilon r squared. And then I only enclosed Q1. And this is going to be in between the shells. And then once again, the reason why this is, is that the only enclosed charge is Q1. So now if I go outside of this, you could see now I have enclosed both charges. Therefore, from Gauss's law, this has to be 4 pi epsilon r squared q1 plus q2, and that is going to be for r greater than big R. Now note, I didn't put any equal signs like greater than or equal because we know that at the boundary, they have to be piecewise continuous. So this is our electric field. And again, this is because now the enclosed charge is both of these. So there's numerical numbers that are given in the problem. And you can see I have my charges and I have my radii. So now I'm going to move and start to plot both of these curves. So I now want to plot both electric fields and potential fields before we do the calculations. 
So I'm going to draw concentric shells, but only a quarter of them. So I'm going to look at this guy, and I'm going to look something like this. And so my concentric shells are going to look something like this. And I want to make a copy of this, but really what we're seeing here before I start to do that, this guy is then going to be R1. This is going to be R2, which is 2R1. This is charge Q1, and this is charge Q1 plus Q2. And of course, this point is our zero point right here. So I'm going to copy this, make a one for the potential field. So here we go. So if I'm looking at the electric field, what do I expect to happen? What I expect to happen is that I'm going to look at my charge Q1. Now, what they're saying here is that charge Q2 is half. So really what this is, if relative to Q1, this guy is really 3 halves Q1. So... I know that because this is zero, I'm expecting that the electric field here should be zero like we talked about. Since there's Q1 is big with a small distance, I would expect that, so let's keep drawing this the way I wanna see this. So this is zero and this is what we expected. So this is for R less than R1. Now, if I just focus on the charge, most of the charge is on the first shell. So I would think that I'm going to have a big jump right in here. So there has to be a discontinuity. Now, exactly how big that discontinuity is, I don't know, but I'm, I think it's bigger than the other one. So now what I'm seeing here is that this is the other shell. So what I'm looking at, as this guy jumps, now it's going to act like a point charge and it's going to be and it's going to be looking like this. And then I hit that conducting shell. So what I'm seeing here is that I have almost about the same amount of charge, but I have a smaller distance. So therefore, I'm actually expecting a larger electric field. Now, as I go to the outside, I'm farther. In fact, I'm twice as far, and the charge is only 1.5 times bigger. So then I would expect that the field is then going to have a small jump, and then this guy's going to go down to zero. So when I'm looking at this, I have two regions. I have the field outside, and then I have the field in between. Now, when I shade these, it's not because I'm looking at the area. I just want to identify the curves very, very clearly. So what I'm saying here is that this is almost the same size charge, a little bit bigger, but this is a larger radius, which is then going to give me a smaller electric field at the surface. So that's how I'm trying to draw this. Now, if I was drawing this accurately, I would be drawing from the center of this thing and treating these as charges at the center. So this is how I would plot the electric field. Now let's go to the potential field. 
So if I'm looking at the potential field, we know that there has to be climbing. And we've already calculated calculated the, um, the stuff outside. So I'm going to have a charge that looks spherical from the outside. And then when I go inside, I have another spherical shell, which then behaves point-like. So the thing you want to be careful about is that potentials must be continuous slash smooth crossing boundaries, which really tells us here is that the derivative exists, which is just the opposite of the electric field. So now, what do I expect? So I'm going to do the red, the green, and the blue to try to signify what the fields are. If I'm outside, then I would expect that this guy is now climbing a hill. Okay. And so when I'm thinking about a hill, I have a test charge. And let's draw this little guy in orange this time. I have a test charge. And what I'm doing here is that I'm going to start pushing up. So this guy is at R equals to infinity. And now it's moving up the incline. Now note that this guy is not as steep as the electric field because it goes as one over R, not one over R squared. Now, because this has to be smooth, then I have to get my electric field and I have to, excuse me, my potential field, and that has to have a smooth transition. So when I'm looking at this guy, you're seeing at the spot that this is what I mean by being continuous. So then my field, I'm pushing against these point charges, even though they're spherical shells, but they behave as charges there. And then what happens is that now I have zero electric charge. So I would expect this thing to now plateau right here. So when I'm looking at my regions, my calculations have to show this type of thinking here. And again, I, I want to look at this thing, and I made a, there's a slight error where I'm at. And what I'm, what I'm looking at is I'm looking at this spot right here at R1. So I'm going to go back and change that, because that is not a smooth thing. So there has to be a derivative that exists. So right in here, there has to be sort of like a rounding effect. Okay, There has to be a rounding effect where I can have a derivative. Once again, that has to be continuous. Now that I have that, let's go mathematically calculate the potential fields. So now we're going to mathematically calculate the potential field functions from known electric field. So I'm going to look at outside. So then I'm going to start with outside shell two. 
which means I'm looking at the potential. And this time, I don't want to put outside. I'm going to say that I want the potential function for R greater than R2. So we know that it has to have this type of shape right here. So let's go calculate that distance here. So when I say distance, I mean electrical height. So if I'm from the outside, this is something that we've already done multiple times. So, so we want to then calculate. So for outside, outside shell two, we could see then that the potential for R greater than R two must be equal to the negative the integral of infinity to R of the field outside. And that's for little r greater than R two dr. We know what that field is. That's this field right here for outside. It's the one down here at the bottom. So then if I come here, I could then come in and I'm going to say, I'm going to pull out that constant. So I'm going to get 4 pi epsilon q1 q2. And then I'm integrating from 0 and from infinity to r of dr r squared. So when I write this thing out, if I do the integral and I deal with the minus sign, I'm going to get 4 pi epsilon r. And then this guy is going to give me q1, q2, minus 0. And so this is the potential outside for r greater than r2. So now I know what my potential function is. Again, picture-wise, what am I actually drawing? I'm seeing that I have a shell system. So plotting this, I'm now looking at a shell system like this. So I have a smaller shell here and I have a larger shell here. And now I'm plotting the function here. And the only thing we care about is just getting to the shell surface. So we know this is R1. Now, if I look at R2, it tells me that it's one meter. So what we just showed here is that this guy has a one over R curve like this. So my test charge starts here. And if I go all the way to the surface, I'm going to get right here. So if I go all the way to the surface, our job then is to calculate numerically what is the value of this guy outside when little r is equal to r2. So now if I start putting the numerical values in here, here's what I'm going to have. So numerically, we calculate this potential function. So I'm going to say that I have v outside at r equal to r2. 
then we already know that this is 4 pi epsilon, and this will be R2 over Q1 plus Q2. So what do we know? So if I plug in my values, this will be Q1 is 2 microcoulombs. Q2 is 1 microcoulomb. And then my distance, R2, is 1 meters. So if you plug in this number, you get 27,000 volts. In other words, the height from R equal to infinity to 1 meter, the amount of work that was done was a height of 27,000 meters. Now, I'm going to move this over just slightly. Because I want to box this guy up and say that this is the potential field outside or little r equal to r2. That's the number that we just calculated. And that's that height. So now I got to deal with in between the shells. Now remember, this is Q1 plus, and then this is Q1 plus Q2. So the second one is then in between the shells. which then says I want the potential in between R1 less than R, R2. So what we did before is that we jumped right into the calculation and then we plotted the function afterwards. I want to do the exact same thing. So here we go. So note that I labeled this one in red, the next one in green, and then the next is in light blue. So I'm going to keep these color coded to try to make it clear. So now here we go. The potential in between the shells is for R1 less than little r is going to be between r1 and r2. So we have to keep thinking about the picture. The first thing that I got to do is that, remember, I work from the outside and I go in. So I climbed all the way to the top of the first shell. So then that means we know what that value is. We have to get there because our reference is at r equal to infinity. So that tells me that's how much I've climbed. So now, how much additional climb, right? So if I was to look at this, this is the climb up to shell two. And now we are then going to start to move to in between. And you see, here's where I'm, I'm really, I'm, I don't really like the language that I'm using. I should not put in between here. What I should put is just the potential function at that location. And then this way, when I'm writing in between, we know that that's part of the calculation that we're doing. So this will be R, this is then going to be R between R1, R, and R2. Really, I should, I'm going to take that back. It's really not at R1 yet. We're in between the shells. So in this situation, we climb higher in between the shells. And that's going to be that additional amount. 
So here we go. We already calculated the first part. So if we put this number in, we already know that this is, putting this in red, that this is 4 pi epsilon all the way to the outer shell. We've already done that. So now our second integral is that we're now only looking at charge Q1 here. So in this case, we know that the electric field is then going to be 4 pi epsilon Q1. And then I'm going from R2 to little r, somewhere in between, and I'm going to get dr r squared. And you could see that the difference here is instead of two charges, I only have one charge because the Gaussian only enclosed the charge of shell one. Now we're going to integrate this expression. So if I integrate this expression, what am I actually calculating? I have my first term again, which will be 4 pi epsilon R2 Q1 plus Q2. Now I'm going to color code this into green. Now that minus sign, remember there's two minus signs that we're dealing with. The first one, I'm going to get a positive sign. So this will be positive and this will then be 4 pi epsilon r, and then I have q1. Now the second one has to do with the minus sign, and it's for r2. So this is important here, because now look what I'm getting. I get a second term that now reads 4 pi epsilon r squared, over Q1. So, oh, I did that in red. That should be in green. Now, what I want you to pay attention to is, again, we've already said that this is outside R1, R2. And then here, this is in between R1 and R2. But the thing that's really interesting is that look what happens. Look at this Q1 term here, and then look at this Q1 term here. You're seeing a cancellation. In other words, note... there is a cancellation. Of Q1 terms. So if I look at this, you're seeing here that now I have this potential. And then I have my first term from the first integral that now reads 4 pi epsilon r2, but it only depends on q2. The second term then reads 4 pi epsilon r into q1. This is a really interesting and the reason why this is interesting, this now, this term right here, this has to do, this is the reference from in between Two shell two. Wow. And that, and because of the calculation inside, that Q term disappears. This here 
is now the additional electric, maybe electrical height change relative to shell two, in other words, at R2. So this is the additional electric height change relative to shell two that only sees charge Q1. We don't see the charge Q2 once we're in between the shells. So if I look at this, this right here is my function right here. So now what does that mean here? If I come in here and I plot this, let me see if I can use that curve. Is it big enough? I think it's going to be big enough. So I'm gonna copy this and bring it down here. So now what we wanna do is that we wanna plot the additional climb due to shell one. So let's plot this. So I have this and, you know, I, I think I'm gonna make it bigger. I need really more space and I'm gonna get some rid of these terms here. So now what I'm going to be looking at is what, what does that expression mean right here? This is what I want. And I want to, I want to keep this close because this is, there's a lot of physics right here. In the first calculation, this showed that we were moving in this direction and we were pushing through. So what this term is telling us is that this here is now our reference. So this is now the reference from in between the shells. This is tricky. Okay, this is tricky. At this point, we don't even care about the charge being an article to infinity. So what I'm saying is that now at this point right here, this calculation is showing here is that our reference is now equal to four pi epsilon R2 and Q2. So now what's going to happen is that I'm going to continue to climb. So if I look at my continuing to climb here, this has to be a smooth one, and then it's getting steeper. So if I was to go all the way to the surface here, and if I was to put a charge here, then I would say that I'm going to climb all the way up to the top right here. But in between, though, in between, we have this guy. It's going to be here somewhere in between. So if I look at this function, what is this additional height? 
So if I color code this, I'm looking at this. There's this additional height from here to here. And that additional height is what I would call my, so then this is the additional height, which is now equal to four pi epsilon, little r q one. That's what that function is telling us right there. So we already know what the height is to get to surface R2. So what about to get all the way to the surface? So if I look at, so then what I'm going to do here is that I want to calculate the additional height change to go from R2 to R1. And here's what we know numerically. So I'm now calculating the term B in between. but I'm gonna go all the way to R1. And that tells me here is that this additional height hat, it depends only on Q1. So then this guy becomes four pi epsilon R1, and this will then be Q1. So now I'm going to choose from the, what's given in the problem that this guy is now 0. 0.5 five meters. So if I plug in all of the numbers, I'm then going to get a value of 18,000 volts, which is now this value right here. This is the additional climb to R1. So if I'm looking at this picture, there's a lot of stuff here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this again. And I'm going to modify this just to look at the numbers here. So my numbers now look something like this. So I'm going to paste this guy into here. And what am I seeing? I want to get rid of this. I want to get rid of this. And... I'm going to then put in my values. So then my values here to climb all the way to here, we saw that we calculated V outside that climbed all the way to R2 was 27,000 volts high. So now if I look at this guy, which should be green, oops, not that, then this height here then I am calculating this height just right there. So if I look at that height right here, I'm really saying that this is my height from, no, I did that incorrectly. This is going all the way up to the top, to right here, all the way to the surface. So I got to go back and get rid of this because that is not correct. So then, I'm seeing that this climb from here to here to R1, this is the value of V in between for little r equal to R1. 
And when I calculate this, this is now 18,000 volts. So right now, if you look at this, we have the total height, but let's not jump too, too fast here. So now we're gonna go inside. So if I go, if I now do inside shell one, we're talking about the potential be inside, again, let's not write inside, or zero less than R, less than big R1. So now if I start to talk about all of the fields, look what I got to do. I got to climb. I got to climb. So there's one section, there's a second section, now I'm in the third section. So if I look at this thing, then I'm going to say that my potential between 0, R, and big R1, that guy now has to be what? It says that I'm climbing all the way from the outside. And I climb all the way to surface two. Then I do the additional climbing in between the shells all the way to the surface R1. So now I am now looking inside between zero R and big R. So now we have already done these calculations. So then I'm just gonna highlight, this is the term that I get just from the outside. I get four pi epsilon R2 divided into Q1 plus Q2. So when I look at the next term, remember there was cancellations. So then I go to the outside in between the shells, and we had two terms. We had 4 pi, and then we had R1, only Q1, <clears throat> minus 4 pi epsilon, R2, Q1. Now, one of the things that we said is that there was going to be a cancellation. So let's go back and remind you, that this term and that term will eventually cancel out. So now if I'm inside, what do I see here? What I now have is that I have an integral that now looks like this. It's going from big R, 1, into little r, and I'm looking at the electric field inside. But we already concluded from the Gaussian that there's no enclosed charge. Because there's no enclosed charge, this is immediately zero. Because E inside is zero. So in other words, the total potential all the way, we get this. So the the total height to inside SHA-1 is then going to be given by the function that then reads V, in, v between 0, little r, and r1. If I do the cancellation, I'm going to get a term that then reads 4 pi epsilon R2 into Q2, then I'm going to get the surface term, which is 4 pi epsilon R1 Q1, and then I get zero. So in other words, this is my potential function. And when you're looking at this, this is a constant. And this is what we call a 
equi potential. And we got to be careful is that an equipotential is not a Gaussian. So now I want to take this guy right here and I want to copy it and then bring it into here. Now, if I plot the whole potential, I'm going to have to modify this curve here, but I'm looking at something like this. Here's what I'm seeing. What I'm seeing here is that my, as I look at my charges, I only see two climbs. And when I see this climb, once I get here, this now is flat. Now, we have to remember that this guy has to be smooth. The derivative has to exist. So there's a rounding effect that occurs. And that's that equipotential curve. So if I look at this thing, we can then see that the total height from zero are all the way to infinity. It's just adding these two terms, which is then 45,000 volts.